Welcome to Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel once again. If you're joining us here in person, or maybe you're joining us via the live stream, or maybe you come across this video at a later time, uh, we, we want to thank you for taking the time to uh, you know, spend some time with us this morning. And of course, if you're watching via the live stream or even here in person, and you want more information about our church, you can visit our website at um, fvccelp.com. And uh, when you do go to the website, um, this is what it looks like. And if you go to the site menu, little tab at the very top there, um, there is um, you know, a little table of contents for the website. And um, there's a whole bunch of information. There's information about Pastor Angel, our senior pastor here. Um, there's also our vision statement or statement of faith. If you're interested in, um, in looking at that, you can visit that. Uh, but I do want to direct your attention to the media tab. Um, there on the media tab, if you click on it, It'll take you to all of our different platforms for um, our studies. They're available, our past and our current studies. We have iTunes podcasts. We have the SoundCloud as well as YouTube. And uh, we do want to encourage you all to listen to those and spread the gospel by sharing these messages on your own uh, personal social media platforms. And um, if you go back to our site menu there, uh, you want to get in contact with us during the week. You can just click that contact us section there. And it'll take you to the bottom. And before we scroll down, there's actually some links um, to our Facebook page, our Twitter, our um, Instagram. We're also on Instagram. And then our YouTube channel as well. So we do want to encourage you guys to uh, subscribe. And, um, you know, it's not about likes. It's about uh, spreading the love of Jesus Christ. That's our heart here at uh, Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. But as you scroll down there, there is, um, you know, kind of an electronic version of, the, of that um, information card. You can get in contact with us during the week. And um, if you want to call the church, there's our phone number, there's our physical meeting address, our mailing address, uh, and also our, um, our email address is there as well. And then our service time, if you're interested in inviting someone or you just want to stop by and, um, and visit us uh, next Sunday. And we don't have a formal offering here at Christian Calvary Chapel. Um, however, we do have the Agape Box if you're here in person. And um, if you're interested in giving uh, electronically or online, there is a link um, in the site menu that'll take you to, um, to do that. It's the Donate Now or Give Now, online giving. And it'll take you to the bottom of the website, and there there's a link to PayPal. And also, if you're watching uh, via the live stream, there's also a link to PayPal um, on all of our social media platforms um, in the video description, so you can uh, donate through that avenue as well. As the Lord leads you, you know, the Lord loves... Um, a cheerful giver. Um, whatever donations are made to the church, they're made solely for the purposes of advancing the Lord's kingdom and, um, and pointing people um, to Jesus. All right, so I think that's the extent of the, um, the church website. Another thing I want to mention, um, we're also now on the CCA website, so if you were to look us up there, there we are. We just wanted to mention that if, um, if you're interested in checking that out, okay. Um, all right. So just some general announcements for the week. Um, on Wednesdays, the men are gathering here at the church at uh, 6.30, and we're currently going through the book of Genesis, so it's a time of fellowship. We also share a meal together. And if you're interested in joining us, you can come by at 6.30. Uh, this week will be in the book of Genesis. And um, if you want more information, you can also contact the church, and we can give you that um, information as well. And um, we also have youth ministry, um, unashamed youth ministry. We meet right after announcements in the back there, and we're currently going through um, the Gospel of Luke. And um, we're also going to have a movie night. Um, we were planning it for this Friday, but we're going to push it back a week. Um, I have an engagement happening, so I'm not getting engaged, but I have an engagement happening. Um, so, so there's there's something happening. Yeah, I, I can't be here, so. Um, so, so we, we, we can do that. So we'll, we'll give you more information that available. And then we're also planning a Western Playland Day. Okay, so that'll be um, something that we can do. If you're interested, you're um, a young person, you want to get connected at the church, um, check us out here right after the announcements or contact the church and we can get you that um, information. I have children's ministry. They meet right after the announcements as well. If you have young children, it's keeping you from coming to church. Don't let that be a hindrance. Uh, bring everybody with you. Uh, we will have a place for everyone here at um, Fresh Vision uh, Calvary Chapel. All right. I'm going to pass this to Pastor Angel. Well, thank you again for joining us. And 
Uh, thank you. If you were here last week to hear uh, Isaac's uh, message that he gave, I hope you were blessed by it. And if you hadn't heard it, I totally recommend that you go to our media page on our website and you will find his, his teaching there. Also, you'll find it on YouTube, um, on, our, on our YouTube page there. But, uh, but yeah, definitely check that out. You know, he's, he's, uh, he's a great teacher as well. All right, if you're joining us online or if you're here, we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 16. We're going to finish that chapter and then move on to chapter 17. Now, I read something interesting here, and I want to share. I wanted to share it with you. And I don't know how old this story is, but uh, it has to do with today's message. If you travel to Greensburg, Kansas, you can pay a visit to what is called the world's largest hand-dug well. Construction on the well began in the 18, 1880s. As the railroads made their way across Kansas, a reliable source of water for the, stream en- for the steam engines was essential. The work was done by teams of men using hand tools, shovels, picks, half barrels, pulleys, and ropes. And rope. As they made their way downward, they lined the well shaft with limestone rock. The finished well is more than 100 feet deep and more than 30 feet in diameter. It took enormous effort to reach the water, but it produced lasting results. The Bible likens wise counsel to water in a deep well. Good advice is not just lying around on the surface. It takes work to find. There are plenty of people who have no idea what they're talking about, but will be more than happy to give you a piece of their mind. And sadly, there will be plenty of people who will give you advice that goes directly against the authority and commandments of Scripture. Anyone who wishes to be truly wise and reap the benefits of godly counsel is going to have to reject the simple approach and put forth the effort. But in the end, the effort is worth it. It says in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 5, counsel in a person's heart is deep water, but a person of understanding draws it out. Well, in our story today, we're going to be looking at how, how Absalom, David's son, didn't put the effort to dig deep enough to find that wise counsel, and because of that, he ultimately paid for it. Now, if you remember, I just want to do a quick overview um, of what we covered last couple chapters, but at this point, um, Absalom, again, David's son, he, he inserted himself as king. He, he declared himself king. He, it, was a, it was a coup against his dad. And in order for, to avoid bloodshed, the destruction of the city, David decided to take as many people with him as he possibly could from the city and just flee into the desert again, into the wilderness. And um, he took as many people with him. And, and as he was leaving, going up um, the Mount of Olives, he was heartbroken. He met people that he saw some people on the way that really... Um, just really ministered to him and really wanted to help him out. And for the most part, you know, these people, he told them to stay behind in Jerusalem so that they can keep an eye about what's going on and maybe give him information that would be helpful and useful in case he needed to go somewhere else, needed to run somewhere else, or, you know, just to... Again, he loved his son, he loved his city, and he didn't want to see it destroyed. He didn't want to see his, anything happen to his son. So he made the choice to leave, to take off. Um, one of those people he ran along the way is Hushai, and he's going to play an instrumental role here in our, in our story, so remember that name. And, um, and also, one of his closest advisors that he had uh, while he was reigning as king, Ahithophel, decided to defect. And he went and now was serving Absalom. So these are just some few things to keep in mind. I'm sure I will bring up some more things, but um, 
have that in mind. And, and, and as we go through these, these passages, hopefully you'll see some lessons that you can draw out of and, and learn. I'm going to be also drawing a few out and explaining them for you. So today's message, I've titled it, The, the Mission to Disrupt. So before we begin reading, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless us this morning. Uh, Lord God, we are very thankful that you brought us here, that we are here to, to honor you and to, to worship you, Lord. I pray that now as we begin, as we open up your word and read it and hear it, you will bless us, that you will speak to each and every one of us individually, powerfully, Lord. May we leave this place different than how we came in. We'll remove all distractions, anything that is bothering us, anything that is getting in the way, Lord, of just listening to what you have to say. Lord, we want to come to you with clean hearts, clean mind, Lord, with clean conscience, and, and so... That's what we desire, Lord, and that's what we, want, that's what we want to do right now. So fill this room with your spirit, Lord, and, and plant those seeds in everyone's heart that's here and everyone that's, that's listening to this and watching this online. Glorify your in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Samuel chapter 16, verse 15. The Word of God says, Now Absalom... And all the Israelites came to Jerusalem. Ahithophel was also with him. When David's friend Hushai the archite came to Absalom, Hushai said to Absalom, Absalom, Long live the king! Long live the king! Is this your loyalty to your friend? Absalom asked Hushai. Why didn't you go with your friend? Not at all, Hushai answered Absalom. I am on the side of the one that the Lord, this people, and, and all the men of Israel have chosen. I will stay with him. Furthermore, whom will I serve if not his son? As I served your, father, your father's presence, I will also serve in yours. Then Absalom said to Ahithophel, Give me your advice. What should we do? Ahithophel replied to Absalom, Sleep with your father's concubines concubines whom he left to take care of the palace when all Israel hears that you have become uh, that you have become repulsive in your to your father everyone with you will be encouraged so they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof and he slept with his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel now the advice of Ahithophel that the the, the advice Ahithophel gave in those days, it was like someone asking about a word from God. Such was a regard that both David and Absalom had for Ahithophel's advice. Well, the scene of our story now shifts from David at the hills of Bahurim to Absalom and his supporters and his supporters entering Jerusalem. And essentially picking up where chapter 15, verse 37 left off. And so there in Jerusalem, Absalom begins the process of taking over as king with the help of David's former advisor, Ahithophel. Now at this point, all that David has left in the city are his concubines. His two priests, Zadok and Abiathar, their two sons, and now Hushai. As a good and loyal friend of David, Hushai now needs to establish his credibility with Absalom and demonstrate to him that he is just as reliable as Ahithophel. He needed to do this. He was tasked to do this by David to keep an eye on Absalom and he needed to do this in order to ensure that he was passing along accurate information to David. So he had to 
do whatever was necessary, say whatever was necessary to get into that inner circle of Absalom. So upon their initial encounter, Hushai flattered him with some pretty ambiguous statements, if you really look at them. He said, long live the king. And he said that twice. But here's the thing. He doesn't mention a name. So as Absalom and his men think that he's talking about Absalom, in reality, he's actually speaking and thinking of David, the real king. Like many others in this entire story that we've covered so far, Hushai has also master the art of deception and double talk. Absalom then tests Hushai by reprimanding him for betraying David. Is this your loyalty to your friend, he said? Why didn't you go with your friend? Again, Hushai gives him an ambiguous response and tells him that he's on the side of the, of the one that the Lord and everyone in Israel has chosen. Here too, he doesn't mention a name, but again, he's saying this with David in mind. But because of his vanity, because of his pride, because he was on top of his world, because he was surrounding himself with people who just were yes men and were you know, just giving him praises, Absalom assumes that, of course, that he's speaking of him. And finally, in verse 19, Hushai's words more openly speak of service to the son instead of the father. In what seems to be almost a, a tongue-in-cheek, almost like in a, in a reluctant way, as I served in your father's presence, I will also serve in yours. Now, we know that David had authorized Hushai's dishonest speech, but David's plan depended on Absalom not knowing what we already know. Well, we later discover that this was enough for Absalom to accept him as another counselor into his inner circle. We'll also eventually see that this decision here, his choice, his decision to, to accept Hushai was of the Lord and set things up for Absalom's eventual defeat. Now, I wanted to mention this before I move on, but the reason why Hushai had David in mind when he made these ambiguous statements because the Lord had chosen David to be king. The people had chosen David to be king. And so, yes, although he was going to be serving Absalom, he was on the side of the true king, David. Now, Absalom had two important tasks to perform before he can rule the kingdom. The first was that he seize his father's throne, and secondly, let it be known that he was officially the king. But unlike his father David, who sought the mind of the Lord through the Urim and Thummim, or from a prophet, Absalom looked to human experience and wisdom. And from a human point of view, he went to Ahithophel and asked, give me your advice. What should we do? He's saying, how should we make this official? How should we let everybody know that I am in charge? I am the king now. At the time, there in Ahithophel, was among the very best of the best when it came to advisors. 
However, Ahithophel didn't speak the mind of the Lord, nor did he want to do the will of the Lord. It appears that his main goal was to avenge himself against David for the sin that he committed against his granddaughter Bathsheba and her husband Uriah the Hittite. So to begin accomplishing that mission, that goal, he advised Absalom to sleep with his father's concubines and to make it publicly known. And in those days it was necessary for a new king when he came to power to inherit the previous king's wives and concubines. However, by taking them while that king was still alive was essentially an act of treason. So when he took the advice and took his father's concubines, Absalom was making it known to everyone that he was now in charge as king. Ahithophel also believed that by having sex with all those concubines, his followers would see that he and David were beyond reconciliation. And it showed his followers that he was serious about everything that was going on. Knowing this, it would further their confidence in him and encourage them to stick it out with him. So rather than taking these women into a private room, and he could have done that because all he had to do was, all he was advised to do was to sleep with his father's concubines. He could have taken them to a room and, and then bragged about it and told everybody or maybe had maybe a, a servant witness so that he, he verified. I, again, he could have done other things, but uh, Absalom took it to a way another level. I, uh, he took it to a level that I guess some people were just really appalled by. And he had a tent set up on the roof and had his way with them in the sight of all Israel. And as he was doing this, he had no idea that he was fulfilling the prophetic words that were spoken to David back in chapter 12, verses 11 and 12. There, the prophet Nathan said, this is what the Lord says, I'm going to bring disaster on you from your, from your own family. I will take your wives and give them to another before your very eyes. And you will sleep with them in broad daylight. You acted in secret. But I will do this before all Israel in broad daylight. Now another thing to keep in mind is that on that very same roof, David had lusted after Bathsheba. And now it became the place where David's wives were being violated. Now, yes, although Absalom here was absolutely responsible for his sinful actions, the reality is that this horrible event, unfortunately, was the result of chastisement, punishment from God for David's sin. As I alluded to earlier, chapter 16 ends by informing us that Ahithophel had a well-deserved reputation for giving counsel almost as good as God. But in this case, his counsel was foolish and destructive. It was foolish and destructive because it was motivated by bitterness. See, church, bitterness has the power to turn our best qualities sour. A Christian author wrote this. I quote, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, likens bitterness to a root, 
Roots have to be planted. So what's, so what's the seed that sprouts into a root of bitterness when planted? It's a hurt. When someone hurts you, it's as if a seed has been dropped into the soil of your heart. You can choose to respond in two ways. You can either reach down and pluck up the seed by forgiving your offender, or you can begin to cultivate the seed by reviewing the hurt over and over again in your mind. Bitterness is a result of dwelling too long on hurt. It's the result of not truly forgiving the offender. Ahithophel's advice was also foolish and destructive because God had already answered David's prayer from, verse, uh, from chapter 15, verse 31. By prompting Ahithophel to give his foolish counsel and in prompting Absalom to take foolish counsel. So as you can see, as you can tell, yes, Ahithophel was liked and respected. He was, again, when it came to top, the top tier of, or the tier of advisors, he was right there on, at the very peak. So this meant that Hushai, Hushai's mission to disrupt, to counteract Ahithophel's advice, it wasn't going to be easy. It was going to be an uphill battle. And he definitely needed prayer for that. And what I want to mention real quick before I move on is, is bitterness. Be careful about that. That's, you know, that can really cause a lot of people to stumble, cause issues in friendships and marriages and in relationships in the church. And as I mentioned earlier, if you have an issue, if you have a problem with someone, don't let it fester. Don't let it sit there in your heart. Talk about it. Talk about it privately. If you need to have someone there with you to, to kind of help you out or maybe to be a witness, um, and to, to make sure things don't get out of hand. If you're a hothead, or maybe he's a hothead, or she's a hothead, you know, you can ensure that, you know, nothing's going to, nothing's going to happen, but do it. Resolve those issues. Don't let that bitterness stay there. And I know I just mentioned the church, but this is also in your marriages. In your relationship with your children. I've heard the stories of children not talking to their parents for years. Maybe that's some of you. Your parent has harmed you in a very horrible, terrible way. They maybe said something to you, or damaged you, maybe did something to you that personally scarred you. Well, if you're a believer, if you're a born-again Christian, Seek counsel, seek advice. The Lord calls us to forgive, to forgive the offender. If you truly want to be more like Christ, if you truly want healing, and you truly want to just have that joy of the Lord, start by forgiving that person that hurt you. I know it's hard, it's difficult, but it's important that you do so. The Lord wants you to. He wants you to be free from that weight. He wants to give you freedom. So don't let bitterness again rule you. Now, as you can see, as we move on now, um, Chapters, there's no break between chapters 16 and 17 like we have already seen previously. So it has to be read and explained as if, as if it were uh, one continuous section. So let's go there now and read, read on. Second Samuel, 
chapter 17, verse 1. Ahithophel said to Absalom, Let me choose 12,000 men, and I will set out in pursuit of David tonight. I will attack him while he is weary and discouraged. Throw him into a panic, and all the people with him will scatter. I will strike down only the king and bring all the people back to you. When everyone returns except the man you're looking for, all the people will be at peace. This proposal seemed right to Absalom and all the elders of Israel. Then Absalom said, said Summon Hushai, the archite, also. Let's hear what he has to say as well. So Hushai came to Absalom, and Absalom told him, Ahithophel offered this proposal. Should he carry out his proposal? If not, what do you say? Hushai replied to Absalom, the advice of Ahithophel, the advice Ahithophel has given this time is not good. Hushai continued, you know your father and his men. They are warriors and are desperate like a wild bear robbed of her cubs. Your father is an experienced soldier who won't spend the night with the people. He's probably already hiding in one of the caves or some other place. If some of our troops fall first, someone is sure to hear and say, there's been a slaughter among the people who follow Absalom. Then even a brave man, then even a brave man with the heart of a lion will lose heart. Because all Israel knows that your father and the valiant men with him are warriors. Instead, I advise that all Israel from Dan to Beersheba as numerous as the sand by the sea, be gathered to you, and that you personally go into battle. Then we will attack David wherever we find him, and we will descend on him like dew on the ground. Not even one will be left, neither he, neither he nor any of the men with him. If he retreats to some city, all Israel will bring ropes to that city, and we will drag its stones into the valley until not even one pebble can be found there. Since the Lord has decreed that Ahithophel's good advice be undermined in order to bring about Absalom's ruin, Absalom and all the men of Israel said, the advice of Hushai, the archite, is better than Ahithophel's advice. Hushai then told the priests Zadok and Abiathar. This is what Ahithophel advised Absalom and the elders of Israel. And this is what I advised. Now send someone quickly to, to tell David, don't spend the night in the wilderness, Ford. Be sure to cross over the Jordan, or the king and all the people will, with him will be devoured. Jonathan and ha ha Ahimaaz were staying in Enrogel, where a servant girl would come and pass along information to them. They, in turn, would go and inform King David because they dared not be seen entering the city. However, a young man did see them and informed Absalom. So the two left quickly and came to the house of the man in Bahurim. He had a well in his courtyard and they climbed down into it. Then his wife took the cover, placed it over the mouth of the well and scattered grain on it, so nobody would know anything. Absalom's servants came and asked the woman at the house and asked, where are Ahimaaz and Jonathan? They passed by toward the water, the woman replied to them. The men searched, but did not find them, so they returned to Jerusalem. After they had gone, Ahimaaz and Jonathan climbed out of the well and went and informed King David. They told him, get up and immediately ford the river, for Ahithophel has given this advice against you. So David and all the people with him got up and crossed the Jordan. By daybreak, there was no one who had not crossed the Jordan. When Ahithophel realized that his advice had not been followed, he saddled his donkey and set out for his house in his hometown. He set his house in order and hanged himself. So he died and was buried in his father's tomb. After having been successful in his first council, 
Chapter 17 opens by telling us that about what Ahithophel advised Absalom to do next. He asked Absalom to allow him to muster 12,000 men, overtake David, strike him down, and bring his followers back to Jerusalem. And eager, I guess he, the more he thought about it, he, everyone thought it was good advice. Everyone, he was like, oh, that sounds great. But I guess he wanted a second opinion. And so Absalom called for Hushai and asked him if Ahithophel's counsel was wise. Hushai told Absalom that David and his men, far from being exhausted, would be more courageous and fearsome than ever. Like a wild bear robbed of her cubs, the king, Hushai said, would be enraged over the loss of his kingdom. So to move against him would be foolish. Initial casualties, which were inevitable, they were going to occur, would cause Absalom's men to lose heart, to be discouraged, and everything that he, Absalom, had gained up until this point would be lost. It would be better, Hushai continued, for Absalom to wait until he could amass a huge army and then attack David with an overwhelming force. And if anyone was found retreating or hiding in one of the nearby cities, that massive force would come and drag everyone like pebbles. Like He gave the analogy of, of ropes, dragging away pebbles. He would uncover every single place that they would be hiding, and there would be nothing left there. Not a rock, not a pebble, not anything. And they would be exposed, and he would, he would get them. Well, Absalom liked what he heard. Like, hey, this actually sounds like a better plan. And decided, he made the choice to follow his, Hushai's instruction and reject the advice of Ahithophel. Now, obviously, this was a the Lord's doing to undermine Ahithophel's advice and to bring Absalom's ruin. And so once all this was now set up, Hushai communicated Ahithophel's advice and his own to Zadok and Abiathar. And, they, and then they sent their sons, Jonathan and Ahimaaz, from Enrogel to David with a message that he must cross over the Jordan now, as quickly as possible. Don't hold back. Don't have a picnic. Don't chill out. Don't have just you need to go now. Because he's coming. But before they could deliver the message, the young men were spotted. And their errand was reported to Absalom. Now, thanks to the boldness and kindness of a woman. Now, one thing I noticed was, as I was reading this and studying it, we have two important women that, that are here in our story that are often overlooked. You had the young girl or the, or the girl that was passing along information uh, to them, and they would pass that information. So she was also a spy. Uh, so the Lord is also using her, and he was also using this woman at the well. Now, again, thanks to the boldness and kindness of a woman in the village of Bahurim, they escaped detection by hiding in that well. They then made their way to David, and they realized who by now had crossed the Jordan. Without delay, David and his followers crossed the river where they sought refuge at Mahanim. Now, back in Jerusalem, Ahithophel crushed because of his counsel to Absalom, had been spurned. He was so crushed by it, so upset about it, 
He committed suicide in his own hometown by hanging himself. So a common question that often comes up here is, why? Why did he commit suicide? Why was it? Why did Ahithophel kill himself? Was it because he, Absalom had hurt his feelings by rejecting his counsel? Was it because he felt like he wasn't that top guy anymore? No. It was because he knew that Shai's counsel would bring about Absalom's defeat. And Ahithophel also knew that he was now serving the wrong king. As a traitor against King David, Ahithophel, in his mind, he thought he would either be killed or banished forever from the kingdom. Ahithophel had a choice here too. He could have begged for forgiveness. He could have gone to to David and said, you know what, I messed up. I'm sorry, please forgive me. I'm willing to accept any punishment you want to give me. But he didn't. He resorted to just killing himself, ending it. He didn't want to get banished, and he didn't want to get he didn't want to get killed by David, and he didn't want to be executed. So he didn't consider any other choice that he had. So rather than humiliate himself and his family in his death, it says that he put his affairs in order, put his house in order, and hanged himself. Listen carefully. He put his house in order, but not his heart. About this, Spurgeon said this, thousands set their houses in order, but their souls. They look well to their flocks and their herds, but not to their heart's best interest. They gather broken shells with continuous industry, but they throw away priceless diamonds. They exercise forethought, prudence, care everywhere, but where they are most required. They save their money, but squander their happiness. They are guardians of their estates, but suicides of their soul. I think he said it well. As someone who has battled with depression and how it's difficult. Maybe you're really in a tough place and you feel like there's no other way. Let me tell you, there is. There is another way. You can get freedom. You can get love and forgiveness and acceptance from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ who died for you, who loved you enough to to die on the cross to forgive you of your sins. So this is going through your mind, these thoughts of ending it, to finish your life, to kill yourself. If those thoughts are going through your head, don't allow the devil to get one over on you. I implore you, don't listen to the enemy because that's his plan. That's his goal. That's what he wants to do. He wants to kill and to destroy. The devil wants nothing more than to fool you and trick you and to make you think you're, un- you're unloved, you're uncared for, that you're all alone. You're not. There's someone there. And that's Jesus. All you have to do is reach out and grab hold of him. So don't listen to the enemy. Now, the other thing his suicide reminds us of is, it also reminds us also what Judas did. He betrayed Jesus in Matthew chapter 27. And in verse 5, uh, it, it points to what David, in chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 7 verse 5, it points to what David had written in two of his wilderness psalms. 
He wrote in Psalm 41, 9, Even my friend, in whom I trusted, one who ate my bread and raised his heel against me. And in Psalm 55, verses 12 through 15, he said this, Now it is not an enemy who insults me, otherwise I could bear it. It is not a foe who rises up against me, Otherwise, I could hide from him. But it is you, a man who is my peer, my companion, and good friend. We used to have a close relationship. We walked with the crowd into the house of God. Let death take them by surprise. Let them go down to Sheol alive, because evil is in their home and within them. More than likely, here when David wrote this, he was speaking of Ahithophel. But Jesus referenced this when speaking of Judas. Because yes, for three, for over three years, they spent time together, they laughed together, they cried together, they ate together, they camped out, and Judas saw the miracles, and man, so it just must have been heartbreaking. When Jesus felt that betrayal that David felt and had written about from Ahithophel. Now, one other remarkable parallel, parallel here then is that many scholars have suggested that it's even likely that Gethsemane, where Jesus' betrayal was enacted, is near the place where David learned of Ahithophel's betrayal. Again, remember, he was walking up that hill of the Mount of Olives in that area when he realized, when he found out that Ahithophel had betrayed him. So, thus, the author of the first gospel, Matthew, may have put together his report of Judas with his eye on the account of David's traitor, just as he shaped his good news about Jesus as the promised Messiah from the line of David. All right. Well, we have a small little section left here in verse 17. So, again, turn to your Bibles and let's finish off verse 17, or chapter 17. Second Samuel, chapter 17. Verse 24. David had arrived at Mahanim by the time Absalom crossed the Jordan with all the men of Israel. Now Absalom had approached Amasa over had, had appointed Amasa over the army in Joab's place. Amasa was the son of a man named Ithra, the Israelite. Ithra had married Abigail, daughter of Nahash. Abigail was sister to Zerurah, Zeruriah, Joab's mother. And Israel and Absalom camped in the land of Gilead. When David came to Mahanim, Shobi, son of Nahash from Rabbah of the Ammonites, Machir, son of Amiel from Lodabar, and Brazilii, the Gileite from Rogalim, brought beds, basins, pottery items. They also brought wheat, barley, flour, roasted grains, beans, lentils, honey curds, sheep, goats, and cheese from the herd of David, from David and the people with him to eat. They had reasoned the people must be hungry, exhausted, and thirsty in the wilderness. The final paragraph of Chapter 17, we're told that Absalom pursued his father. He went after him. He went after him across the Jordan to Gilead, having appointed Amasa as commander of his forces. Now, according to 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 17, Amasa's father was an Ishmaelite by birth, but an Israelite by religion. The narrator also points out that he was David's nephew and a first cousin of Joab. 
Let me remind you, Joab was David's military commander. After this, we read that David was encamped in Mahanim. As he was encamped there, three men came to him with necessary, non-perishable provisions for him and his people. Those three men were Shobi, Machir, and Brazil, Brazil, Brazili. I'll give you just a little bit of background on each one of these men. Shobi was the son of Nahash, the deceased king of the Ammonites. Chapter, said, chapter 10 said that his brother Hanan had rejected David's goodwill and suffered for it. But Shobi, although he was by birth an alien, cared more for Israel's king than most of the Jews did. In a very similar way, many Gentiles have received him who was rejected by his own. The next person mentioned was Machir. Back in chapter 9, we're told that he cared for Mephibosheth for many years until David brought Jonathan's son, because he was Jonathan's son, back to Jerusalem. See, he ministered to those in need, whether a lame prince or a dethroned king. Those who give their substance to aid the cause of Christ through hospitality will have their kindness returned a hundredfold. When our Lord and Savior returns in His glory. The third and final person mentioned was Brazil, Brazilia, who had helped sustain David the entire time he stayed at Mahanim. Now, when we get to chapter 19, we'll see that he was a very wealthy man, and his support meant a lot to the king. Later on also, when David was on his deathbed, it says in 1 Kings chapter 2 that he told his son Solomon to elevate the sons of Brazili, Brazili to places in the royal court. If you're serving the Lord, if you're ministering, in your, in your local church, or if you're ministering here, if you're ministering outside the church in one way or another, be encouraged with the fact that Christ won't forget those who have ministered to him. Jesus said this in John chapter 12, verse 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. If where I am, there my servant will also be. If anyone serves me, my father will honor him. Now, as I begin to close, I want to share with you what we can learn from the two villains in our story, Absalom and Ahithophel. Both of these men had been close to David earlier in their lives. Both chose to rebel against David and seek his overthrow. Neither man seems to be godly or to view circumstances from God's point of view. Neither seems disturbed by what they sought to kill, that, that they both sought to kill God's anointed king. Both men will have their lives end tragically in death. Both must have seen God's hand at work in David's life and in his life and in his rule as king. Both are willing to cast David aside in an attempt to build some kind of kingdom of their own. Both men are like Satan and like Adam and Eve in what they are unwilling to play in that they are unwilling to play a subordinate role. They seem to think that under David's rule, they are being prohibited from something better, which they can obtain by pursuing their own interests. These two men, Absalom and Ahithophel, failed to correctly answer the most important question any person will ever answer in their lifetime. Who will I serve 
as king. Absalom and Ahithophel don't want David for their king. Both, in effect, want to be king of their own lives. But in rejecting David as their king, they are rejecting God's king. And thus they are rebelling against God himself. Both of these men have great ability. They have their, they're gifted. But in the end, their talents are of no eternal profit. This question has never really changed. It was a question before there was ever a human king over Israel, and it has been the question ever since. Adam and Eve rejected God as their ultimate authority and sought to set themselves above him. The Israelites rejected God as their king, and they demanded to have a king like all the other nations. Absalom and Ahithophel and the others who followed in the rebellion against David rejected God as their king. Friends, when our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ came to earth, he came as the one who would sit on the throne of his father, David. He came as God's anointed king. And yet, what did the crowd say? What were they saying? They were saying they had no king but Caesar. The Lord Jesus Christ came the first time to be rejected as Israel's king so that he might bear the guilt of our sin and provide the means for us to enter the kingdom. And this is where his mission to disrupt comes in. His mission to disrupt the devil's plan to kill and to destroy, to ruin humanity, to spoil it forever. And that's what he did when he came. Listen carefully. All who receive his gift of the forgiveness of sins and eternal life will reign with him for all of eternity. Fact is, the truth is, he's coming again. He's going to come back again powerfully and visibly. And he's going to come to defeat all his enemies and to establish his throne upon the earth in what we call the millennial kingdom. All those who have received him, who have believed in him, who, had had, who have placed their faith in him, will be, be part of this kingdom and they will be saved all those who have rejected his gift of salvation have rejected him as king. When he comes again, all men will bow before him as God's king. But only those who have received him as savior will enter the kingdom. So now, let me ask you now, who is your king? This is the most important question you will ever answer. Is Caesar your king? Is the internet your king? Is money your king? Or is Jesus your king? If you realize now your need of a savior, and I want to lead you to the cross, I want to lead you to, to, to Jesus so that he may forgive you of all your sins, and so that that's where you're at. Pray this. Close your eyes and bow your head. And with all your heart, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died in, for my sins and rose from the dead. And I'll turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. 
If you prayed that, reach out to us. We want to hear from you. We want to know your story. We want to you know, know how you came to hear this message. And we want to maybe lead you in your next steps of your Christian walk. Um, if you're here locally, we want to invite you to, to our church here and, 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 and see if this is where the Lord call, has called you to, to be at. Thank you for watching this week. Thank you for spending your time with us. I hope that you have a great week. Um, be blessed. Um, and uh, we'll see you next week. Love you. Bye.